Before Italian restaurants, there was no middle ground between expensive and posh restaurants or functional and cheap cafes. They offered a whole new approach to eating out. Italian restaurants played a major role in the tremendous cultural shift in the way we eat in Britain. They provided delicious tasting food at a reasonable price and uh, with any luck with an Italian waiter murmuring sweet nothings in your ear with an enormous pepper pot and so on. And that led people to the idea that eating out wasn't something you just did for your birthday or for high days and holidays. It was something you did when you were perhaps too tired to cook at home. And that sort of thinking was completely new. My father's achievements have influenced British eating habits in that Spaghetti House was one of the first restaurants to be integrated into a way of life where people wouldn't think twice of going into a restaurant and ordering a meal, a glass of wine and a cappuccino, which today, of course, is the norm. And in restaurants and at home, spaghetti has always been Britain's favourite pasta. The only dilemma has been, how do you eat it? I've seen a lot of people in a lot of restaurants get into a muddle. Mamma mia! Spaghetti eating lessons for those about to take their first Italian holiday. Twist the fork round on the plate and then lift it up so that you've got a bite-sized piece. It's like a dish. And you go in like a dish. One of the great problems facing the British was how to eat spaghetti. I mean, knife and fork, you cut it up into small pieces, uh, you eat it with vegetables, without vegetables. These were in the early days, and it, it caused tremendous confusion. Possibly the easiest way of eating it, uh, if I can go back to the Italian traditional way, is to make sure you've got a serviette. Better to save on the laundry bills. Then you take a fork, you mix up the pasta, and you use the fork on its edge like this, and you twirl it round. And that's it. However, one has to say, eat it as best you can and enjoy it. There are really no rules. It didn't take long before people realised they could also make pasta at home. By the 1970s, spaghetti bolognese, or spag bol, was served for dinner throughout suburbia. Oh. It was a well-to-do British cookery writer that initially inspired many to try Italian cooking, Elizabeth David. Her books set the scene back in the 1950s and 60s and have had a lasting impact. The ever-recurring elements in the food throughout these countries are the oil, the garlic, the pungent local wines, the aromatic perfume of rosemary, the brilliance of the market stall piled high with pimentos, aubergines, figs... By creating the demand, Elizabeth David also influenced what was stocked in shops. In city centres you could buy all sorts of Italian ingredients, but for most people basil and parmesan were unheard of and their only source of olive oil was the chemist. As her books went into paperback in the early 60s, a lot more people began to ask for ingredients that were being talked about in her books. And so they also start to create a bigger demand for wanting to be able to buy the food so that they can cook it. Her books were definitely part of that influence, which then became, by the 70s, sort of roller coaster effect of, of the popularity of Italian food. Now we've got our pasta shells with that lovely three cheese stuffing. What I'm going to do now is make a cheese sauce. Now the basis of this sauce is a roux. It's equal quantities of fat to flour. Now I've got some melted butter just here, and Kathy, you've got some sifted flour, thank you. It's going to form into a firm ball. You want to make sure you mix it really carefully at this stage to make sure the flour gets properly distributed. Just like with the pasta, starch molecules start to escape from the flour, and that's what thickens up the sauce. But if you have clumps of flour that haven't been stirred in, then the starch molecules get tangled up together and you end up with lumps in your sauce. Another nice tip to avoid lumps is by warming up your milk first. No need to bring it to the bowl, just warm it through and then add it to your fat and flour gradually. Can I start? Yeah, there you go. It's really important to add it gradually because there's a load of water in the milk and there's a load of fat in the butter and fat and water don't mix easily together. So if you put too much of the milk in, all those water molecules will want to hang out together rather than mixing in with the fat. 
Whereas if you put them in gradually, they have a chance to be properly integrated and then you don't get lumps. Now you know when your sauce is done, when you take a clean spoon and place that into your sauce and it coats the back of the spoon really nice. At this stage you can add all kinds of flavourings. I'm going to be adding some white mature cheddar cheese. Let's throw that in please. I'm also going to add a little pinch of nutmeg. You can use fresh grated nutmeg. How and then, mustard. Yeah, that good dollop of mustard. That really brings out the flavour of the cheese and works so well with this sauce. Now what we need to do is put the sauce over the top of the shells. Little that sauce running between the pasta shells. Mm. Parmesan cheese over the top. It's going to go a lovely golden brown. And it's now going to be placed into a preheated grill. Delicious. In the 1980s, a new type of pasta hit the supermarkets. Fresh pasta. It's made with egg. It cooks really fast and filled or plain. We love it. In 1979, we actually started producing fresh pasta from a small industrial unit. Uh, the demand from the beginning has been astronomical. We had to change premises four times. What we do today, in one day, we used to do in a week. People used to ask us, what's your aim? I used to say, I want all the children in England to learn and to love fresh pasta. And from then on, we haven't turned back, really. You can think in terms of a pasta generation. The growth of fresh pasta is, is genuinely a very recent phenomenon, and it's taken off very, very quickly. The amount of money spent on fresh pasta in the supermarkets could even start to rival that spent on, on dry pasta. I prefer the fresh. I prefer the fresh one. Fresh pasta, definitely. I usually go for the finest spaghetti I can find. I like linguine. They say it's good for you. It's my favourite food, what can I say? In Britain, we're now teaching the Italians a thing or two, with all sorts of exotic stuffing for fresh pasta. Our tastes range from char-grilled vegetables to lemon chicken. In the development kitchen of Pasta Real, they create a new taste every month. Today, they're working on spinach and ricotta. A bit like my recipe. Now we can put this salad together. I'm going to scoop some of these tomatoes. They smell absolutely sensational. A few slices of mozzarella cheese over the top of that. A nice sprig of fresh green parsley. All we need now is some good olive oil. Mm, let's have a taste of this. Mm. It smells good. It tastes good. And the sauce is totally lump free. And the pasta is still al dente, isn't it? It is. Have you tried mm. the tomato? Mm, no. Tuck in. Is that good? 